Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think uh, uh, working together with business is important because business is not only taking the big share of innovation, but it's also the part of society that is responsible for the major part of investments in innovation, and that is where it really matters. And I apologize. <coughs> So uh, we just came out of the Environment Council uh, that took place uh, yesterday and there was a long strategic debate on assessing the results of where we are and I'm uh, more than pleased to give you fresh out of uh, the Council, so to speak, an insight on where we are. Um, let me underline how much, um, and picking up the words of uh, uh, Marcus Bayer, uh, how much we evaluate the cooperation with industry. Uh, we can have our discussions on small operational points. But the basic approach is that we count on business and on a market approach to put in place the, uh, the new technologies and the low carbon uh, society that we will need in the future. So we are uh, very much uh, looking forward to a continued cooperation and I will in my slides uh, point at where we are in our debate and where we are going. So on the road to Paris, uh, I think that the most important points have already been uh, mentioned by Marcus because we are uh, very much joining up on the same agenda in Europe. Uh, it's an agenda between 28 member states, but also you know, largely supported by stakeholders, parliamentarians, national uh, authorities, etc. And so the most, the most important point is that we have fair, ambitious and legally binding commitments by all parties. And that is the importance of it, by all parties, and I come to that in a minute. Of course, we want also a long-term goal, because that is what the scientists have been bringing on the table of politicians. Our heads of state already endorsed the goal for 2050, but now the IPCC brought on the table a goal for 2100. So we are ready to look into that. But of course, the most important that drives the policy action is the one of 2050. And that's uh, pretty long term, because you know that uh, one of our major economists of, uh, of, uh, of our continent said that that in the long run we are all dead and we think that 2050 is a very operational time perspective to uh, talk about the long term. We will need five yearly reviews and I come to that in a minute because we will have all these pledges on the table and these pledges will need updates and uh, how to organize that is going to be very important. Rules for transparency and accountability. It's not a very sexy word, but it is very important. Because we will have all these pledges on the table, but we do know that the statistical apparatus with, uh, with which some are working is sometimes open for creative accounting, and we can't have that. We have to have pledges that are measured according to common rules. And these common rules are best set in the context of the UNFCCC, and they have been set in the past. In fact, what we are doing in Europe is implementing Article 5, 7 and 8 of the Kyoto Protocol. And who is doing that? We are not doing that in the Commission. The Environmental Agency is doing that. And it is a routine business where member states report their figures based on what the stakeholders bring on their table. These figures are being collected, and every year, uh, six to eight weeks before we go into the COP, we have a perfect update about where we are, which sectors are doing well, where is the problem, etc. And you saw that as part of that preparatory material, yesterday Eurostat came with figures uh, indicating that we had along the EU a five, almost a 5% drop in emissions, while economic growth was 1.3%. Uh, so that, I think, was a, a good message yesterday that we got out of Eurostat. And all this information goes into the reporting according to the common rules for transparency and accountability that we have in the Kyoto Protocol. Adaptation is an issue that we do not debate that heavily inside the EU. It's an issue. But it's an issue more for local authorities, because if you have a port, if you are situated in a low-lying region, think about most of the ports who are industrialized in Europe, they are all in risky zones. Because if we believe what the IPCC is saying, that means that the sea level rise in Ostend is going to rise at least with half a meter, and according to some with more than one meter by the end of the century. Now, if we translate that to the port of Antwerp, 
Antwerp of Amsterdam or Rotterdam, that means something. So we will have to have defenses built and that's going to go uh, to cost us a lot of money. Now this is mostly national, local money, but it's an issue that we will have to uh, consider and that's not only for us to consider. Think about drinking water supplies in the Himalaya, where millions of people Indians, Chinese, Bhutanese, Nepalese are dependent on the drinking water that is coming from the glaciers. Are the glaciers, when they dry up, when they melt, as we see them in the Alps, then it's going to be a very brutal wake-up call for those countries and one of the emerging scarcities, and that's driving the attention of the Chinese for the subject, is water. Water is the most open manifestation of climate change. And in China, the brutal scarcity that is manifesting itself is water, more than anything else. Efficient and effective implementation <coughs> is of course um, very important because um, what do we put in effective and efficient, that is what uh, uh, was mentioned by uh, Marcus Bayer. It is about uh, low cost solutions because we know that climate policy is having a cost in the short term. So keeping these costs down and effect effective and efficient implementation is uh, really uh, putting the, uh, uh, the uh, importance on this. So, just to come back on what all parties are going to deliver, I think this INDCs, the intended nationally determined contributions, are of absolute importance. And we know the process goes much slower compared to what we hoped for. In fact, that is partly bad news, partly good news. It is bad news because we hoped that by now we would have all these INDCs on the table. What is the good news is that in all these countries in the world, they started to discover when you make a policy plan, you have to submit that at the UNFCCC, at the UN, that it must have an endorsement by the highest political level. And that's not easy. We know that in the EU, having the heads of state and government endorsing your plan is not easy. Now, that is what is happening. And so that's the good news. That is that these INDCs are on the table. They are not as numerous as they are. But there are some important elements. Apart from the Europeans and the G7, we have also Mexico, Gabon, Morocco, Ethiopia, um, Serbia, China is announced for the end of the month, but we are rather confident before uh, the summer. What is important about the countries I'm mentioning, that is that we are successful in circumventing the firewall. Because these are pure developing countries. And they are making their plans. I was myself in Morocco when they adopted their INDC. Their INDC announces for new energy investments 42% in renewable energy. The neighboring country, Algeria, is not doing that. They have no investments in renewable energy. Now, what matters is that you have the domestic regulatory systems built up for the policy that you want to deploy. And so, having Morocco there, or Gabon, or Ethiopia, <coughs> Or in a couple of uh, <coughs> pardon, in a couple of months, also the Latin Americans and many Asians coming is um, of incredible importance for the success of the Paris scope. So it takes more time, but it is useful to do it because it's the ideal way to circumvent the firewall or to have the differentiation in the commitments by all countries circumvented in practice. Now, um, we did our 40%. I think we, we are safe. Um, we have been setting a bar. Uh, and I think that we want to measure where the bar is being followed by others. And we agreed with the Moroccan authorities in the beginning of October to have an assessment conference of all the INDCs that are on the table, just to know better where we are and what needs to be done in the future. So the INDCs which is a horrible abbreviation, are important because they press the governments to come forward with policies that then they will have to implement because you cannot propose your own policy and then forget about it. So it is the whole secret is more time goes into the preparation, but I'm confident that is INDCs because they come out of good economics and good re policy reflection that they are going to be uh, implemented. 
Now, where are we in the process towards Paris? Also there, there is good news and bad news. The good news is that we have a policy process that is quite... Um, pardon. Now it's going really bad. What is... we go back? Uh, so there is no surprise any longer in what I'm going to say later. So the process towards Paris, what I wanted to indicate, but the point that is not working, is that we had the major economies forum, we had the informal ministerial, we had the Petersburg dialogue, but that all culminated in the G7, uh, a summit that was incredibly important, not only about agreeing on a long-term goal, but also on mobilizing the political energy that is needed. The Japanese announced their INDC. Yes, there was a bit of pressure necessary, and I have no illusions that for others also some kind of pressure will be necessary. But we are going to uh, see um, the issue of climate change being taken up by all possible levels, by my own Commissioner Arias Kanyete or Vice President uh, Cevkovic, but also by Mrs. Mogherini, who is very active on this, and we had the eu CELAC summit last week. We had uh, the EU-Japan summit. Uh, we have the EU-China summit coming up later this uh, month. A very important one, very important talks going on on climate change, and I think we will see some more news coming from China in this respect. And as I mentioned, the INDC assessment conference in Morocco. So that is going relatively well. What is not going well is the UNFCCC negotiations. We had such uh, a session in Bonn until the couple of last uh, uh, days ago. And uh, the, this process is bogged down in helpless detail. We have a negotiation text of more than 90 pages. At last, we got a request to the co-chairs to make the text shorter and more operational. And um, that is now what is going to happen by the 24th of July. But it is very, a very slow process. And we will need a lot of political steer so as to make sure that uh, we get out of the uh, conundrum we are finding ourselves because the negotiation text uh, of more than 100 pages to negotiate with 196 countries is just not the right document we have on the table. We need a document of 10, 15 pages in order to have useful discussions. That's what we learned in Europe and that is also what is applicable in the United Nations Framework Convention. But what is good, and that is the first line, that is that the incoming French presidency is very active on all possible fronts to involve the stakeholders, to involve businesses, to involve NGOs, to involve local authorities, regional authorities, and there are very intense discussions today taking place. So the political context that is driving forward uh, the process, I think, is well managed by the French authorities, and I think that uh, we we see uh, behind closed doors that landing zones, zones are slowly emerging for the difficult negotiations. They are always difficult, but in any case, we are going to see, I'm sure, a, a good outcome out of Paris. What are the three key elements? The first is differentiation or the firewall. I think uh, we are all worried about that. The Kyoto Protocol divide between developed and developing countries is outdated. We need to have the emerging economies as well. Now that's a holy Bible that we cannot touch in the negotiations. So the firewall is not going to disappear. But we have now that process of INDCs on the table, and if all these emerging economies make their pledges, then we are circumventing the firewall. And that is the, the differentiation, I think, where we are about to succeed. But of course, important players such as China and others will have to come forward with their pledge. Legal form is another splitting issue. Uh, we have a very good conversation with our American friends, but our American friends have a, a problem uh, with the Congress and the Senate, and they enter into um, election mood, and that's not going to facilitate the discussion on legal form. So our legal experts are now trying to see what can we have as a binding agreement, because that agreement must be binding, but at the same time there may be elements that we are putting in a context in the context of an annex or another uh, decision that will have to be made in the context of the United Nations. 
And then the other final thing is balance. Balance is that, of course, what is important is reducing emissions. That's why we are coming together. Without reducing emissions, we are not getting anywhere. But there is part of the world that is suffering from the effects of climate change. I have no other money than to undergo the suffering. Think about Pakistan, big parts of Africa, poor countries, etc. That is why the insistence on adaptation is very much uh, uh, brought on the table. We have to deal with it. It's driving a lot of money. But uh, in any case, we, we will have to do this. So these are the three political issues. As I said, the first one on differentiation, de facto, we are about to solve that. The second one on legal form, I think we will find a solution. Our legal experts are uh, fairly well uh, investing into that. On balance, um, mitigation, adaptation, it will depend on a financial package. And that's going to be painful. A financial package discussing more money today with public authorities running out of money, with uh, almost the whole Western world still suffering from the banking crisis and the fallout on public uh, finance. So we will have to be more clever. We will have a big conference with the World Bank and the IMF in Lima in October, where climate finance is going to be discussed. And it is uh, obvious for all of us, in particular for you, that the private sector, the investments must be driven into the right in the, to the right direction. That is what we are discussing. So we should be less focused on the check that we are going to sign off to one or the other authority, but on the question whether the investments are happening in the right technologies, in the right places, and so the involvement of the private sector, and that is what the World Bank has understood, that's what the European Investment Bank has understood, and so the role of the private sector is going to be increasingly important for the good logic of it, but also because because uh, the brutal reality is that public authorities have already committed themselves to the 100 billion uh, per year by 2020, and uh, it's uh, a challenge to, uh, to uh, bring all this money on the table. So the question is then, are we going to reach what we have to reach, which is the 2 centigrade Celsius that the scientists have been bringing towards us? And that is a slide that I borrowed from an NGO, the Climate Action Tracker. Uh, we will see more of these graphs uh, in the future. I'm not going to say it's the absolute truth, but if we are not going to do anything, we know we are going to end up by 2100 closer to five, even six degrees, rather than the two degrees. Now, the baselines have been made by the IEA being updated, and we see that with current policy projections, we end up between 3.6 and 4.2 degrees Celsius, which is still not good enough. But now comes the interesting part, and that is the red line. These are the pledges that have been made as of now. We count that the pledges are bringing us around 3 degrees Celsius, not yet the 2 degrees. Now, yesterday, as you saw in the newspapers, the IEA came forward, making an estimate on the basis of the INDCs on the table. They make an estimate that, as far as we know, we are going to land around 2.6 degrees Celsius. We will see how far we get. That's why we have in Morocco our conference in, in October, two months before the, the Paris uh, uh, summit. But that is a very important one. What is the message? That policy is bringing down the uh, normal course of things from 5, 6 degrees to 2, 3 degrees. The other element is that we are not going to get with the pledges alone on the 2 degrees Celsius. I think that is what we presumably have to conclude already as of today, hoping that all the pledges by the other countries are going to be very helpful. So the question that is emerging, what are we going to do? to solve that gap that, say, half degree Celsius that we still have to solve after Paris. And that makes the discussion about the future after Paris uh, very important. Now, um, as I wanted to say, the, the class is half full, half empty. I, I think uh, if we would uh, end up with something two and a half degrees Celsius, 
Uh, it would be disappointing that we are not yet at the 2 degrees Celsius, but it would put in place policies that already can execute it in all countries of the world, be it in Morocco or in China or in Brazil or in South Africa. That is what matters. We have to get started with the job. Now, what do we do in Europe? Uh, you know the slide where we dissociate GDP from greenhouse gas emissions, the first part of the slide. The good thing is that we are about to decouple uh, economic growth from emissions development. Uh, I think that's a good story to tell. The latest figures yesterday of the Eurostat confirm that in the recession we are doing even better. Uh, so we uh, have moderate economic growth, but we are then, as an as a economist, I would conclude, improving the technological base of our economy. And the basic good news is the second part of the slide. That is that per unit of GDP, the CO2 emissions are going down systematically. And that is the implementation or the putting into, uh, <coughs> into force of cleaner technology. Even in countries like China, where the, car, the curve is uh, starting in 1990 fairly high, the gray line is going down fairly fast. We, it's not yet as where we are, are at the bottom, the EU line, but the trend is clear. Also the red line, the Russian Federation, not particularly known for their environmental uh, uh, credentials, I would say, but nevertheless, we see that the technology base um, in the economy is improving. It does not bring us to the two degrees Celsius, but without that trend, we would be far off uh, making things better. Now we have agreed in Europe on the 2030 targets. You are going to debate today about energy efficiency. The fuel savings that we are estimating are considerable. It will bring us a major benefit for energy security. We think that with the policies we are planning for 2030, we can have a 11% cut in energy imports in 2030. You know that we import every year 400 and billion, 400 billion euros. That's more than 1 billion euro a day. If we can shave off 11% of that, that's a major benefit to uh, the European economy. And it's all about innovation. It's all about new jobs. It's not about green sectors and gray sectors and whatever sectors. We should stop talking about that. It's all about cleaner technology because a windmill is made of steel and concrete. But we do it in a very clever way. A solar panel is made of chemicals. We do it that in a very clever way of putting chemicals together. But we need, in other words, and steel and concrete and chemicals. It's the way we are combining them that uh, needs to be sorted out. So that's why in Europe we decided on targets for 2030. We decided on an energy union. We decided on a 40% target. And we decided to at least have 27% of renewables and 27% of energy efficiency improvements in the economy by 2030. So that has been confirmed. Now we are putting that into operation. And you know that the ETS has been uh, confirmed by the leaders as the major tool to do that. Why the ETS? Because it's a market-based instrument. The alternative to ETS is a bunch of regulatory instruments that are going to increase much more the red tape compared to any other instrument. So it's an open invitation. We have turned the page on the market stability reserve almost. I mean, we are finalizing the procedures, but that is behind us. But now we go in a new phase of the ETS review. And we are currently working very hard uh, in our offices to come in the coming weeks or months, but in the not too distant future with our proposal on the ETS review. And we are working very hard with many of you, as you know, on uh, the carbon leakage, on the modernization and the innovation funds, things that all have to be put into operation. Coming to the subject of the day, energy efficiency is of capital importance. And when I simply take the official statistics, you see how much in the beginning of the year 2000 we have been able to turn the page and how we are reducing, that's the blue line, how we are reducing since the beginning of the years 2000-2005 the energy uh, consumption in the EU. We should continue that. Uh, the leaders decided on the 27% target. Um, 
we uh, have a raging discussion whether that is good enough, whether that should be reinforced, yes or no. Our impact assessment is going to uh, show that. But in any case, the trend is clear. We have to improve energy efficiency, and we have been champions in Europe to improve energy efficiency. So let's, let's build a story around that. If we just look around at what we have been doing, I think on cars, the progress has been absolutely fantastic. Um, if you replace your car after five, seven years, you know that your car has an energy efficiency improvement between 25 and 35 percent. And it's continuing. What we do on uh, buildings, um, on new buildings, we are moving fast to passive houses, but it is existing buildings where a lot needs to be done, a lot of refurbishment, and we know, unfortunately, that that is a very expensive thing to do, but it's possible. Also there, I think when we see what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe uh, with, uh, with the help of community funds, that's absolutely fantastic. In terms of appliances, we have our energy labeling system. I think that the refrigerators, freezers, everybody goes to the shop and is well informed about that. We are reviewing that system to dynamize it. And, uh, of course, EU industry itself has been improving uh, the uh, use of energy uh, in a quite spectacular manner. We, we think that uh, in the last 10 years, about 20% improvement has happened. So, I wish you the best for the day. My uh, summary is, we count on you to make the innovations and the energy efficiency investments happening. Business is absolutely important into that. If we can have market-based instruments to do that and the motivation of the consumer would be great. And if the rest of the world would follow through, that would be just greater. And we are working very hard to make that happen. Thank you very much.